Okay, shalom. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. See some uh, differing experiences of sound in the chat. I suggest uh, perhaps restarting if you're uh, if you're experiencing any tech difficulties. Um, but for now, I uh, will welcome y'all to another. Uh, week of our Basics of Jewish Prayer class uh, brought to you in part by the D. Dan and Betty Kahn Foundation and the generosity of viewers like you. Okay, so we're in week five. This is a six-week course. Uh, so we're in our penultimate session tonight. And I'm excited to dig into a bit about the Kavanah, the... the uh, feelings, the intentions, the spirit of the Amidah and prayer in general. Okay. So uh, to start off, let's, uh, we'll just take a few questions. So we talked about the structure of the Amidah last week. So let's, let's ask some questions about the Amidah. What, what questions do you still have about the Amidah? Certainly we only scratch the surface um but whether in fact whether it's questions about the amidah or prayer in general uh we can just have some open q a for the next uh six minutes or so anyone have any uh questions yeah victoria so jake as i was going through um uh, morning uh, Shabbat and evening Shabbat Amidah, I didn't find very many differences except for some of the commentary. Um, and I know sometimes we contradict each other, but um, you know, the, um, especially in, in um, uh, giving thanks and, 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 um, and, and what's the other one, excuse me, as I fumble here, uh, the day's holiness. Um, so when you get into Kavanah tonight, I'm gonna to be very interested in the intention that you suggest is set because um, there, I, 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 I read disagreement among the commentary. That sounds interesting. What um, do you remember? What the kinds of disagreements were like? No, you go ahead, and I'll try to discover what I thought I found. 
Okay, great. Yeah, that that sounds that sounds interesting. It is true that um, a lot that the prayers there are um, certain differences between say the evening amida and the uh, and the morning amida, um, and some of those differences are uh, we'll we'll see one later tonight uh, when we if if we get to it we'll look we'll kind of go through the whole uh, Shabbat evening amida, and for example the the Shabbat evening Amidah's blessing for peace says Shalom Rav. Uh, may, it starts with Shalom Rav. May a great peace uh, be be put upon the people of Israel. And the morning Amidah says Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha. Make peace and goodness and blessing. Um, so they're both about peace, but they're different kind of articulations. And so there may be. Um, it's actually something that I would be. Uh, interested in uh, returning to at some point. Um, I, I'm not sure of all of sort of the different vectors between evening and morning prayer, but the commentaries might actually help to illuminate that. So yeah, so if you find those, uh, feel free to let us know and we can revisit that. Yeah, Victoria? I actually found one. Oh, great. Um, so in the morning, um, Kedushat Hashem, mm -hmm. naming the holy. In the evening, there was disagreement about, um, I, I guess I'll put it, raising the dead. Uh, one said that um, we don't uh, deal with that in this prayer anymore. Mm -hmm. And the other one says um, uh, the Kavanah, uh, is that you are eternal, the life of all that lives, the love that all that loves, you animate lifeless matter. So there was one disagreement in the commentary, one mm, commentary and one kavanah. Right. So they're um, they're they're wrestling with the traditional. The the tradition is is a blessing. Um, for example, not uh, it, for example in the avot and gevurot blessing. Um, the second bracha of the Amidah in Givurot, the blessing for the powers, uh, traditionally the, the blessing ends with Baruch Ata Adonai Mechaye Hametim, who uh, bless, blessed is, is uh, blessed are you Adonai, who uh, gives life to the dead. And in Reconstructionist liturgy, the emendation is made so that it says Baruch Ata Adonai Mechaye Kol Chai. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives life to all life, life to every living thing. And so what I think is, is happening in those commentaries are that there are sort of different takes on, on uh, how to work with that tradition. So the, the Reconstructionist, the sort of official Reconstructionist liturgy is that actually the, that those words are changed so that uh, we don't just need to sort of bring a different intention to it the the, the words are different mordecai kaplan rejected str strongly rejected this notion that uh god will resurrect the dead um and uh and so therefore it changes the liturgy so that it says you give life to every living thing um but i think that other commentators that the sidor contains are sort of hearkening to the earlier tradition to say, you know, how do we work with this? Um, what what should our intention be when we're talking about giving life to, to to the dead or to every living thing? So that might I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, it does help, Jake. But that begs another question: um, Does that um, um, relate to? Um, what what was what was the phrase the, the memory of the masana the memory of the messianic message is that relates to that yeah it, it does Curious it, use of the word memory too yeah I, I don't know i don't know the um uh the, perhaps yeah the remember perhaps remembrance of of the that the uh the expectation of of the messiah um, it is connected, yeah. The traditional belief is that 
uh, in the messianic era, the Messiah will come. The very traditional belief is that a king will arise from the line of David, uh, some kind of military ruler, and will uh, usher in a new era of uh, sovereignty in the land of Israel, and uh, and also and you know they're going to rebuild the temple, and also uh, the God will resurrect the dead. I don't. I think it's. I don't know if it's all of the dead. It may be just Jews. I actually don't know. Um, but I do know that the the there is discussion in rabbinic traditions that the uh, corpses. Uh, part of why the bodies are to be buried uh, just in, in shrouds traditionally is that uh, as they are in the land of Israel, um, that the, the bodies kind of go through underground pipelines to, uh, to uh, transport and, and pop back up in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So cool. Thank you. Yes. And, and Kaplan rejected this, uh, this belief. Um, he, th he thought this was one thing that ought to be reconstructed. So yeah, a little bit of added texture there to, uh, to the Amida. Any other, uh, Amida questions before we, uh, dive more deeply into, uh, tonight's subject? Okay. Well, um, if you have other questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and uh, we will get started. So tonight, uh, what we're covering, uh, at, last week we touched on the Keva of the Amidah. This week we'll talk more about the Kavana. And really, as I was preparing for this, um, for this presentation, I realized that probably what's needed is, is a broader discussion about Kavana of prayer in general, because so the uh, the Amida is, as we know, referred to as Hatafila, the prayer. Um, so it's really our kind of prototype or archetype or uh, the the paradigm of of prayer in, in Jewish tradition. And I think it would be difficult to suss out meaning from the words of the Amida if we didn't have a sort of developed framework for approaching prayer already so we're going to uh we're going to touch on some of this tonight um next week we will be uh kind of just covering some odds and ends so maybe some of the torah service maybe uh the kiddush the kaddish um and if there are any uh things in particular topics that you're interested in learning about for next week's kind of wrap-up session uh you can either put those in the chat or um or let me know via email. But for tonight, we're going to be talking a lot about kavana, about intention, meaning, all that kinds of good stuff. So just a little review about the facts of the Amidah. We covered this last week. This prayer happens every day, every service. It's the centerpiece of Jewish prayer. The rabbis of the Talmud referred to it as ha tefila, the prayer. Amidah means standing. Though, of course, we know uh, standing is not accessible to everyone. It's not a problem if you uh, need to rise in spirit rather than body. Uh, we also talked a bit about the choreography. So there's it's not just standing, but you're standing with your feet exactly placed together. Uh, there's certain patterns of bowing that you bow four times uh, at specific instances. And uh, throughout the prayer, when people are praying, of course, Jews tend to move about and shuckle and do all kinds of other motions. But it's just the four bows that uh, that are the standard practice. And then the closing, uh, the closing bows for Ose Shalom, you know, that kind of thing. And of course, start you you start it by taking three steps back and three steps forward. Um, yeah, these are some of the things we talked about last week. So those are all kind of elements of keva. If you recall from our first session, we made this distinction between keva and kavana. So whereas uh, keva is more about the nuts and bolts, what to do and how to do it, uh, kavana is more about why and how 
what is the meaning of this? And so uh, tonight's session, we'll be dealing more with what is the meaning of this? And to do that, like I said, we're going to have to explore a bit about what is the meaning of uh, Jewish prayer and what is the meaning of Jewish prayer to us? So there will be some opportunity for uh, reflecting on our own relationships with prayer and liturgy. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, I have several kind of readings that we'll read through and talk about to get our juices flowing. And then uh, with the time that we have left after that, we'll work through the Amidah and we'll kind of just talk it out and, and wrestle with it and uh, find try to find meaning in it. Um, and I'll reiterate this towards the end of class, but I really do encourage you to, uh, at some point, take time with the Sidur and read through the Amidah and maybe on a separate sheet of paper or even with a pencil in the margins of the Sidur, if it's your own, make notes about what appeals to you, what stands out to you, where your questions are, what connections arise, all that kinds of stuff. And if you may feel like it's a little sacrilegious to, um, to mark up the Sidur in that way, I assure you that if you look at the uh, High Holidays Machzor of any uh, uh, service leader, someone who's leading the High Holidays, it's filled with dots and signals and little notes about how to sing what and things like that. And so I think that if the service leaders can put the dots and signals about how to pray it, that we should all feel empowered to mark up our own Sidur um, with uh, little notes about what's meaningful for us or, you know, circling the parts that we really like or that kind of stuff. Of course, you know, uh, don't do that with the Sidurim you borrow. You do that with the Sidurim you own. And, uh, and of course, uh, treat books with respect. Yeah, post-it notes are, are a, great, uh, a great thing. So the thing about Jewish prayer, let's start by talking about some common hurdles in Jewish prayer. Hurdles, of course, are obstacles, but we're meant to go over them. So these are, I hope that these won't be stumbling blocks, but they'll just be hurdles. So obviously a giant hurdle in, in Jewish prayer in many of our prayer lives is that uh, Jewish prayer happens in a foreign language. We actually don't have to pray in Hebrew. Um, there's different halachas, there's different Jewish laws about this. Um, and you really should actually be saying the Amidah in a language that you understand. And so uh, I would recommend, you know, if, if you don't know Hebrew or if you can only work a little bit in the Hebrew and then you bounce back to the English, I recommend, uh, you know, working with the language that you understand because I think that it's actually better to, uh, to develop the prayer practice first, and then you can get the Hebrew. I think it's better to have the sort of spirit of prayer and, and the, um, you know, connect with the deeper meaning of it, and then you can learn it in the, in the language. But for many of us, Hebrew is a foreign language. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of it. And Reconstructionist services use a lot of Hebrew. Not every type of Jewish service does. Some use more and some use less. Ours use a fair amount of Hebrew, even if we have a sort of pared down liturgy. But that in itself can be quite intimidating. It can be quite opaque for people. So that's a hurdle. That's a hurdle such that uh, someone might open the C door and see all the Hebrew and say, I don't know what all this is. Close, not for me and you know go find a different religion or something so you know we we want you to overcome that hurdle that that intimidation of the foreign language but then once you get into the language say you if you know the hebrew you've learned hebrew or you're reading it in translation still the imagery is quite opaque there the language the the stuff that we're saying is the product of people who lived, for the most part, long ago. If you recall, the Amidah was fixed around 400 CE. That was kind of a while ago, 
the world was a bit different than it is now. And though there are certain things that are, uh, you know, can be said to be rather universal about human experience and uh, the various concerns that we have as we move through the world, a lot of the language and imagery that's used uh, may not really resonate with us. So most commonly, uh, Jewish prayer by and large refers to God as king, traditional Jewish prayer. Well, there's a number of problems with that. And I can name three off the top of my head. One is that a king is a man. Two is that a king is a king. You know, in terms of our ideal form of government, monarchy probably isn't that high up there for most of us. And three, uh, we don't really experience kings and royalty. I mean, the, sure, you maybe you watch the royal wedding or something on TV, the Queen of England, but like that's just a whole other world from us. Like what, whatever king means to to us today is not equivalent to what it meant to people a thousand years ago, five hundred years ago, two hundred years ago. So that's something to work with. The imagery is can be hard to connect to. Or you have stuff where, you know, it's Friday night, it's Kabbalat Shabbat, you really love all the singing that we do, and you start looking at the translation, and it's all just like synonyms for God is so great, let's sing to God, let's make noise to God, let's uh, exalt God, let's be jubilant. And it's like, what? You know, what is all this about? I can't connect to any of this. Um, which would bring me to my third point. You know, I mean, there's also stuff about like, there's angels up in heaven and they're singing. You know, for some of us, that's an exciting image. And for others, that's a, uh, there's not much there that we can grasp. You know, our day-to-day our -day life doesn't involve thinking about angels. And we, you know, have to make some, uh, some leaps to, uh, to find anything that we can connect to. And the other, a uh, very common hurdle is one about God and one about spirituality. So Jewish prayer, traditional Jewish prayer, obviously, is written in a theistic idiom. It's about praying to God. We are bl we're blessing God. There's something uh, there's there's something about like we're supposed to sort of acknowledge or declare how blessed God is. A prayer like the Kaddish, which we haven't looked at, but uh, we'll do next week, is all just like glorified, mag magnified, sanctified, hallowed be the holy name of God, the great and holy name of God forever and ever. And so it really prompts these questions about like, one, first of all, like, what are we, you know, are all, any of our uh, complex struggles with do we believe in God? Do we struggle with a belief in God? Do we decidedly we don't believe in God? In which case, what are we doing, doing all this prayer? But then it also, you know, and there's also a whole other bag of questions about spirituality and spiritual practice, which is like, okay, you know, many people, for many people, the sort of image of God as, you know, the, the old, a uh, white bearded man in the sky isn't a workable image, but they might have a different form of spirituality where God is a, you know, I, I think of God as the, uh, the source of life that pervades everything. And, um, and my personal spiritual practice is sort of about attuning myself to that sacred force that flows through everything. Well, it begs the question then, like, what do these ancient words have to do with attuning myself to that sacred force? If they're in a language I don't understand, if the imagery doesn't point me to that, it doesn't get me any closer to that, why am I even saying it? So these are, there are plenty of hurdles here. Okay, so, well, I have, I have some thoughts and uh, suggestions about overcoming these hurdles, but I do really think that it's uh, incumbent upon each of us to uh, to reckon with these things uh, because everyone faces this. 
even even uh, you know traditional Jews who grow up in the culture face you know having to make meaning of this because none of us are writing our prayer book from scratch. We're all kind of inheriting this tradition or choosing it or you know somehow it's uh, prefabricated and we have to figure out what to do with it. So here are a few thoughts of kind of my, why bother some uh, some various things. And then I want to hear from y'all about why bother, but I'll, I'll kind of read through and explain these. So there are, you know, many reasons why to pray Jewishly, why to, why to have a prayer life, why to use the liturgy um, instead of say, why not just meditate, you know, why not just do mindfulness meditation or why not just do chanting of any kind or a free form kind of expressive prayer from my heart. Why should I use the C door? So here are some suggestions that may or may not resonate with you. Um, one is, you know, some people pray because they believe that prayer works and they believe that like there's a right way to do it and this is how to do it. So if I want to pray for healing, I, you know, I work through the Amidah and I get to the Rifua section where it's praying for healing, and that's where I can put in my prayer. Um, similarly, some people think that it's this is a way to connect with God. For people who believe in God and, and seek a relationship with God, this is the way that uh, people presumably older and wiser than us have established and passed down that this is how you talk to God. So that's that's one reason to pray, okay. Another thing, maybe it's the rhythms, the rhythms of a prayer practice. We've talked about how there's three prayer services a day. Maybe that's maybe that's something that you find some kind of grounding in the in the routine of it. Plenty of people uh, who are embedded in those routines have their own doubts about God or maybe are decided atheists. It's not that uncommon in a. Uh, uh, observant communities for people to for it to really not be about God that it's about the rhythm it's about connection it's about community um, other things is that like maybe prayer Jewish prayer praying the liturgy feels like real Judaism and there's something to that I think that um, you know reconstructionism views they, we kind of answer the question, what is Judaism? And the, the uh, Kaplanian response is like, Judaism is the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. So basically it's a, uh, a descriptivist definition of Judaism, which is to say that what is Judaism? It's what Jews do. But there's, you know, we don't want to we don't want to go too far with that definition and lose any sense of uh, specificity. So, yes, it's uh, maybe the synagogue has a jogging club. But does that mean that jogging is real Judaism? It's a thing that Jews do. It could be part of Jewish culture. There's a way that um, it may feel that uh, that doing Judaism kind of literally by the book is the real, the real thing, you know. So for people who are seeking to, to have uh, to build or uh, deepen a Jewish identity, um, that prayer is is a great, a great gateway, because you're, uh, you're really, you're really dealing with the stuff that's sort of unquestionably Jewish. Jewish practice on its own terms, dealing with in its, in its own idioms. Some other stuff, uh, maybe there's a thing about connecting to our ancestors. Um, I think in my own, the ancestors are either material or spiritual. So whether they're actually in your family genealogy or it's your sort of adopted family genealogy. Um, there's there's something powerful about that that you can think oh you know maybe my four times great grandfather prayed this prayer in a similar way or something like that maybe not 
doesn't work for everyone, but it works for some people, and it's certainly motivation for some. In my own personal genealogy, I think I'd have to go back perhaps to my four times great uh, grandfather or something to to find uh, sort of uh, traditionally observant Jews saying the liturgy like that, but whatever works. But other things are that uh, it's something to investigate, it's something to critique. So this is kind of on the question of like, well, why should I use the Siddur? Why should I use Jewish prayer instead of just praying from my heart? And this is, uh, you know, it gives you something to work with. I know a lot of people, uh, when it comes to creating something or working on something, they are very creative people who do best when there's a, a draft that someone else has prepared. When someone else gets it started, then they have something to work with. You know, you're not starting from scratch. And then you can, uh, you have something to work with and to, to bounce off of. It sort of reminds me of, um, I've heard it said of, of tarot cards that, um, uh, you know, the tarot reader says, listen, either these cards will uh, will resonate with you or they won't. But either way, you're going to get clearer about what it is that you actually want or what it is that you're seeking. And so I, I think there's something to that with the liturgy where, um, you know, it's some content, it's something to wrestle with. I certainly uh, experience that when we do Torah study that we have a, sure, we could just get together and have a, a weekly chat to, uh, you know, talk about the issues of whatever's on our mind, but having, uh, having a little fodder, having something to ground in um, can be quite productive. So I think liturgy can, can function in that way too. But one other way that I've, I've thought of is that it, it can occupy the monkey mind. Do y'all know this phrase, monkey mind? It's like, it comes from, a, I think it might be a production from DT Suzuki. It comes from kind of Zen traditions, but the monkey mind is your mind that's just bouncing from here to there, here to there, like going all over the place, always looking for something, like always looking for stimulus, always finding stimulus, finding something interesting. So if you sit in, in meditation, you'll, you'll, uh, find pretty quickly that that monkey mind is there. <laughs> um, and so I think some people when they're praying, they're doing some kind of interesting thing when they're davening, having some kind of split consciousness, split attention where they're working through the words of the Siddur quietly out loud to themselves. And it gives them kind of a focal point. And there's something else happening while they do that. So they're directing their, uh, their attention to the words of the Siddur. And, um, and while that's happening, there's something happening on another level, on a level of spirit, or maybe it's even, uh, for some people, it's, it's a more of a mental thing, or some people it's in the heart, you know, but there's a, there's a way that you can uh, sort of busy your uh, you know, keep your keep your mind busy while the rest of you is doing uh, something else in the same way that, uh, you know, if we're we might doodle or do a craft or something while we're uh, listening to something. And uh, yeah, I see Robin is, is uh, got working on something over there. Um, and so it's a similar kind of thing where it's like, no, it's not the case that you're not paying attention to both things. It's that there's different processes happening. And so, uh, especially for people who, um, who believe in a sense of, of soul or spirit or, you know, heart connection or something like that, that yeah, perhaps the words of the Siddur, they keep the, the mind just busy enough so that, uh, you know, your spirit can, uh, can reach out to God and God can reach back or something like that. Um, and then another uh, note that I just wanted to to consider was that uh, part of it is is also relishing in the poetry. So 
Some people like to read poetry. Not everyone likes to read poetry. I will say that it's for some people. It's like what, like, I don't get it. You know, that's an easy. I I think that's probably said very frequently about poetry and and jazz music. That I don't get it, but um, that this is a cat tail in the in the screen here. Um, but the thing is, is that yeah, prayer prayer is poetry. Um, these prayers are poetry. They're there, um, if we think about what poetry is, it's sort of a um, a specialized form of language that that uh, plays with various elements um, that, uh, to you know it's it's sort of elevated from prose or casual speech. Um, it's intentionally put together. Um, prayers are poetry. Some of them are. Uh, some of them are, are sort of explicitly poetry. There's a whole genre called piyut, uh, which is religious poetry. And th this is the, the stuff of things like yedid nefesh or lecha dodi. That's, that, that's truly just medieval poetry. Um, and in the same way that folks might read a poem, uh, you, can, you can read the Sidor that way. You know, reading it with a bit of spaciousness, reading it with a bit of openness to uh, the way that the images fit together and uh, what comes up for you while, while that happens. And that's right, Victoria, the Psalms as well. Yeah, explicitly poetic. Um, so I'm wondering also, so these were kind of just various, a whole smattering of, of options. Um, I thought about making this like a checklist that we could see like, okay, which of these actually apply to me? Eh, I don't really think it feels like real Judaism. It's not really, I don't think about my ancestors. Oh, but I need something to do with my mind. Okay, that's the one. But I'm curious, what, um, what are your reasons to overcome the hurdles? Because here's the thing is that you're in a class about Jewish prayer. You're, you've been attending a series about Jewish prayer um, that has so far been a lot about the nuts and bolts of the thing. And so there's a question there of like, well, what motivates you to learn the nuts and bolts of the thing? Um, and for some people, I think it, it may be more on the side of, uh, you know, that these, that th for some, for some people, it may be that they see the link between the nuts and bolts and prayer and a spiritual life, and that's why they're in it. And for others, you know, there are people in our congregation and plenty of congregations for whom spirituality is not a relevant concept. So I'm, I'm curious, what are some of your motivations and what are some of your reasons for uh, wanting to learn? Yeah, Shell. Okay, um, here's my sort of mishmash. In my, in my, my own relationship to prayer involves rhythm and routine and channeling our ancestors. I mean, if, I, I wouldn't say most of this stuff if, if it wasn't English, but there's something about going into a group of people reading Hebrew that tells me this is a communal kind of thing that's been going on for centuries and people have, have been killed because of their devotion to these particular practices. Um, fortunately, I'm, I'm not and I've never been in a position where I've run into really serious overt anti-Semitism. I suspect I might cling harder to the rituals, but right now the rituals don't, don't attract me much other than my recognition that this has been going on for a long time. And I remember being kind of offended is probably too strong a word, but when I, when I occasionally would attend uh, reform services, you know, my head, well, my emotions would say, no, 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 you got to stand up here, you got to sit down here, you got to bow, and, and, it's, and it was strictly because I was, you know, my reflexes in my pre-bar mitzvah days were in a conservative congregation, and that's what I learned, um, and, and sort of related, I remember talking to a, a friend of mine who was Catholic, and he was bemoaning the lack of the Latin mass in, in his, his, 
his response was, I didn't leave the church, the church left me. Um, just because, and I'm, this is my take on his comment, was that this meant something to him in terms of community and the ritual that was involved. Uh, I, I, you know, um, and that's kind of how I feel. I wouldn't say those, the words in the Amida if I had to say them in English. And as far as the, the Kaddish is concerned, for crying out loud, it's Aramaic. I mean, you really got to work to figure out what those words mean. But that doesn't mean that probably everybody sitting here, you know, you wake them up in the middle of the night, they can say Kaddish in Aramaic just because they know how to do it. And, that, and that's, what, that's what it means to them. So that's, that's sort of my confused mishmash of, you make me think about this stuff too much. I just shouldn't. <laughs> Better not to think about it. Just do it. Yeah. It's good. It's a good, that's a good Jewish attitude. I mean, just do it and question it, but don't think about it too much. <laughs> All right, Victoria, what, what you got? So Jake, um, I have to say that before my conversion and of course since um, it's all it was all of, of, of these points, except number four, feeling like it's real Judaism. Um, this was the last mystery, so to speak, not that I don't have a whole lot more to learn. Um, but with this piece, um, I feel like I finally know what I don't know. It, it's really a key for me in my Judaism. Mm, thank you, Victoria. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's, and I think, I think for most people, there's a, uh, it's a mishmash for a lot of people, I think. And I think it's, you know, I, I think it's also, uh, it's not a problem if if it's sort of ineffable or hard to articulate, you know, because I think there's um, there there is something that's hard to articulate about. Well, why do Jews want to do mitzvahs? Why do Jews want to do Jewish things? Why do Jews talk so much about Jewish identity? Why do Jews do all this reflexive stuff just because it's Jewish? And it's like. I don't have a good answer, you know, like, I don't know, like, I, I, it's, it's strange. It's like, like, I was thinking about this, about wearing a yarmulke, like, sometimes it feels good, you know, I'm like, this, it feels good to be like, and why does it feel good to, is it because I'm honoring my tradition or because I'm, you know, humble before God, or it's like, I don't know, but there's something that uh, feels kind of, um, you know, something gets activated in it, I think. Does anyone else want to share about uh, their reasons to overcome the hurdles? Um, I don't know how to talk. Ah, uh, we hear you. Hey. Oh, it's me, Rhoda. Hey, Rhoda. Hi. Yes. Oh, I miss you guys. Where? Where's my picture? Never well, uh, you need to be on video in order for your picture to show how I cannot ever there do you go cannot there do without Roz. Um, thank you, Roz, for telling You're me. You're welcome. This. You're welcome. Um, go back to video if you can, or um, not. I'm gonna try. You were on it. There you go. Oh, oh. I don't. Even, okay. Um, I always felt like I grew up at Sheretz Sedek, where everything was in Hebrew. And to me, that was, you know, the real way to be in the community. And for many years, I went to an Orthodox uh, synagogue, Hachmi Leblin on Linwood and Elmhurst with all those Polish boys they brought over. Does anybody remember that but, but me? And it was, everything was in kind of a yiddish -y Hebrew. And to me, that was the sound of religion and, and that, English doesn't do it. Um, I'm going to admit uh, to sometimes being transported by the ancient melodies, even though I can't carry a tune. 
I just listen to Raz, you know, and, and um, because it evokes in me a connection to the past. Sure. And I think, why do we even go to services? We aren't alone in a double way. We aren't alone by ourselves and we aren't alone as Jews. So I didn't know that I thought these things and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Roz and I miss you guys. And I swear if I went to Michigan, I would go to services eight times a week. That's all. Thank you, Rhoda. And beautifully said, we miss you too. Thank and really you. wonderful too, to express that. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's that. I think that's what part of this is about is that, um, you know, there is something uh, valuable in, in striving to put to words some of these underlying uh, mm -hmm. impulses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ross. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, thanks, Rhoda and everyone else for, for your comments. Um, before we started with the, uh, with the comments uh, out loud, um, I wrote in the chat that um, for me, there's at least one more, so why bother? Uh, being in community with others around prayer, learning from others, uh, and so forth and so on. And of course, several people have mentioned mentioned community. And I, I just um, want to offer just one very simple example. For me, um, if I'm at home alone, lighting the candles and chanting the prayers, um, I will probably immediately start crying because I'm alone, not in community, and missing all kinds of people, people who are in the community, people whom I've lost, who were in the community and so forth. Um, but uh, being in community, lighting the candles every night as we have been um, this week, and as we did differently last year, we did it uh, amongst ourselves. This year we're with, with several other uh, shuls um, doing it makes all the difference. And um, for me, it's, it's, it's really being, being together, sharing, sharing the ideas, sharing the words, sh hearing the Hebrew, uh, chanting the songs. And um, for me, most particularly, it's also uh, channeling our ancestors and um, uh, helping to uh, continue the traditions, the continuum um, from thousands of years ago into the future. Thank you, Raz. Beautifully said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I did forget to put a uh, community on here, um, but absolutely <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the fabric that binds it all together. Okay, so these are, yeah, this is, these are wonderful things, and I, I want to encourage folks to uh, continue to kind of chew on this and, and uh, sit with this question as you... Right. May uh, I say on. one more thing? Oh, sure, oh, sorry. yeah. Sorry. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, you know, I I just, you know, I don't want to, like, I think I told you guys that I grew up in this reform household, and I mean, really felt robbed of my Judaism. But, um, you know, I guess for me, it's almost like visiting a foreign land, you know, this now, this experience. It's like I'm visiting this foreign land, and um, I'm discovering... I mean, one of the things that I really resonates with me about uh, Jewish prayer is, I guess it's just the, I, the, the fact that the Jew is concerned with the sanctity of life. You know, I, I don't mean like in the, I don't mean in the right to life sense. No, but I mean that life is sacred, you know, that it's, that it's worth caring about, that it's, there's something about, um, about that realization that is so, I think so intrinsic. And it's, uh, I don't know, sometimes it just seems very beautiful to me. And, um, you know, it, we should, I think, strive for that. And uh, I think that's, I've, I've kind of been discovering that. It's like this land, if I'm visiting this land where everybody, where, you know, the Siddur, it, it takes life seriously. It, it, it asks you, you know, look and, and notice that life is sacred. It's not just, not just trash, you know, don't trash it. So I, I think it's awesome. Anyway, thank you. That's beautiful, Sarah. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that it, it asks, it invites you to to notice and to uh to affirm the the sacredness of of reality it's beautiful well let's read a bit um i have a few readings for us quotes from 
from various thinkers to kind of uh, get our juices flowing a bit more. Um, so this is from uh, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi of Blessed Memory, who is uh, known as the sort of godfather of the Jewish renewal movement. Jewish renewal, uh, for those who don't know, is a movement that, that uh, comes up in the sort of arises in the 70s and 80s and beyond, um, sort of in the gray area of being not quite a denomination, but not just a few people. Um, uh, and, and Zalman, he himself came from a Hasidic background. Um, he was actually a Chabad, uh, one of the first people, one of the first Chabadniks uh, sent out to go hang out on college campuses and hang out with the young people and get them to be more Jewish. Uh, but he was doing this in the 60s. And he got really, he was very into meeting these young folks where they were at and got very excited about counterculture and uh, Eastern religions and all kinds of uh, groovy things. Um, definitely recommend looking into Reb Zalman. But uh, the, um, he became a real uh, Rebbe, a real spiritual leader of this movement. Uh, that's sort of a form of what's called like neo Hasidism. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the spiritual aspects of Hasidic Judaism uh, mixed with progressive social attitudes and uh, contemporary lexicon and um, uh, very, very cool things. Um, renewal has been uh, very influential on, on all spectrums of, of Jewish life, um, including uh, Reconstructionism. There's a lot of um, crossover between the Reconstructionist movement and the Jewish renewal movement. But um, this comes from a book that I that's, that I recommend called Jewish with Feeling, a guide to meaningful Jewish practice from Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi of Blessed Memory. And uh, could I get a reader to read these two paragraphs for us? Raz is going to do it. Okay. I'll be happy been, to unless someone else wants to. Okay. Go no problem. I called it. I called it. <laughs> okay. The Siddur is only an outline. The prayers in our Siddur were collected over centuries, but the Siddur is not a museum vault of liturgical music and information. It is a living document. Like a coloring book, though, the Siddur gives us only the outlines. Coloring those outlines in with life, context, feeling is up to us. Rather than reciting dutifully from the Siddur, seek a genu genuine encounter. Take your time. Let the Siddur speak for you. Daydream, space out. Go where the images take you. A single phrase may be enough to transport you to a higher level. Make yourself transparent. Place yourself in the presence of God. This is what our Siddur helps to do. So Reb Zalman is, is speaking a language of, of God, of course, um, and he's he's uh, Jewish renewal is kind of above all concerned with spirituality. So um, so this is sort of par for the course for him to say, rather than reciting dutifully, just reading everything as it is, have an experience with the Siddur, space out, let, let the images take you somewhere else. Um, so that's an approach that we could take, you know, even as we uh, seek to build our competency with the nuts and bolts of, of Hebrew liturgy, uh, when we're seeking uh, to experience the yeah. words as sort of uh, invitations for transformation, we might need to take things a little more slowly. Yeah, Victoria? So I'm absolutely delighted with his invitation. Um, and it also reminds me, uh, my reaction almost immediately was yes, but I have to learn the rules so I can break them properly. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're gonna, and I think that's, uh, I think our next reading is, uh, is taking, is sort of coming from that uh, approach a, a bit about uh, 
On the other hand, why should we pray with the Siddur? Um, coming from uh, Rabbi Reuven Hammer, another great Jewish book, Entering Jewish Prayer. Um, could I get a reader for this? I think this one might be two slides, but we'll just read this one. Make a call on them, Jake. Ah, very good. Rhoda's uh, exercising her teaching experience. That's right. To help, help, call, help train call on me. Them. Don't. Uh, wait how about you, them. Bobby? Oh, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I okay. saw you on there. Yeah, I know you did, <laughs> Jake. <laughs> No magic there. Um, why use the Siddur, our Reuven Hammer? The fact that we can and should pray anywhere at any time in our own words should not cause us to neglect or minimize the importance of the set framework of prayer that Jewish tradition provides. The regular use of the set forms creates a pattern of life that constantly emphasizes that we stand before God, forcing us to recognize this even when we would be inclined to forget it. The prayers of the Siddur sensitize us to the world of Jewish values and Jewish concepts, and thus create a moral and spiritual milieu that enriches us and causes us to measure ourselves against the standard outside of ourselves. That is the ancient and original meaning of the word lehit palal, pal, to pray placing oneself in a situation of being judged and measured. If our personal prayers re refresh our traditional devotions, our traditional prayers give weight and structure to our personal devotions. Yeah, so we have a bit of, um, I love this, that this, the Siddur sensitizes us to the world of Jewish values and Jewish concepts and thus creates a moral and spiritual milieu. So it, it sort of reminds me of what Sarah was saying about exploring a different land, mm -hmm. is that it's like, yeah, there are textures of Jewish prayer, of traditional Jewish prayer. Te the Siddur, you know, sort of paints a certain picture. What are the, what is the Siddur concerned with? It's not just what Jake is concerned with, you know. If I was writing it from scratch, I might, write something very different and I might forget completely about some other thing that this that the, the rabbis uh, um, uh, turned into a, a set prayer. And let's um, this next this is from the same the same book. So we'll, we'll read this one and I'll, we can discuss this a bit. Uh, Victoria, would you read for us? Thank you. <clears throat> We may begin to pray by using our own words, or we may find it easier to come to prayer through traditional formal prayer, either with others or alone, reciting at the prescribed times the prayers and formulas found in the Siddur. It is foolish not to take advantage of the paths that are offered that have walked before us. It is all very well for a fledging playwright to say that reading Shakespeare might stifle his creativity, but it is also rather silly. Culture is created by building upon the past. Words have echoes and are enriched by them. Therefore, if we have difficulties in expressing ourselves through prayer, we can find help in the prayers of those who went before us. Sometimes a prayer written hundreds or thousands of years ago will express exactly what is in our hearts. Sometimes an ancient phrase will help us say what we mean or will evoke new thoughts within us. As we incorporate the insights of others into our own minds, we enlarge our horizons and deepen our capacity to think and feel. We need no imit we need no imitate mechanically or limit ourselves artificially we in order to that. be inspired and enriched by the past. I think it's we need not imitate. Yeah. Right. I already said that, Shell. <laughs> we need not. Right. Yes. You got it. Yes, we need not imitate mechanically or limit ourselves artificially in order to be inspired or enriched by the past. This kind of blew my mind when I when I saw this expressed, and um, yeah, talk about a um, a sentiment that I wouldn't have encountered on my own. I don't think I ever would have thought of prayer this way had I not read it in this book. To say it is foolish not to take advantage of the path that others have walked before us. 
And then to say, yeah, the example of the fledgling playwright who says, oh, reading Shakespeare is going to stifle my creativity. Yeah, that's perhaps, well, there's something to that, but there's also something foolish about that. And that is something that really, uh, I think is really worth thinking about, that prayer is a, um, first of all, prayer is a practice. Prayer is like a muscle. Prayer is an exercise. Like it, for those of us who are new to prayer itself, of course it's going to be opaque. Of course it's going to be hard to connect to. We're just getting started, you know? And, um, and there are ways to sort of ramp up uh, to, to train and to uh, train at ways that are appropriate to our level. But that doesn't mean that, um, that we just throw the whole thing out. This was really interesting to me. I wonder what, other, what do others think of? So we have these kind of, they're almost uh, in tension with one another. That, that Zalman, Reb Zalman is saying, have an experience, take your time, don't worry about it, you know, space out, do your own thing. And Rabbi Hammer is saying, walk the path, get to know it. Eventually it'll, uh, you know, some days it will speak to you, some days it may not. What do folks think of, of these ideas? Yeah, Victoria. Um, well, uh, walking the path and knowing um, what the rabbis and others wrote as stylized as, as it can seem at first really provides an inspiration. So I really appreciate what they're saying, what, what uh, Rabbi Rubin is saying here. It's a, it's a great image also because the, uh, the word that we often translate as Jewish law is halacha. And halacha means, holech means to go or to walk. So halacha, halacha is the path, the way, the walking. So it's, it, it is, it is a, uh, it's a great image to, to have with us. What do others think of these, uh, these sort of various approaches to prayer? I have something to say. Yeah, Rhoda. We can be anywhere and go to a synagogue. Um, it can be in another country, another state, like in, in the South, where even Hebrew sounds Southern. And, um, and a familiar melody, you know, one that everyone shares, you know, even though there are so many different branches of Judaism and so many songs. And it just like brings you into the group just like a single phrase and then you're part of something maybe it's sentimental or it's just the function of memory but it's also connection and because of that i think it's what keeps us keeps us jewish is the prayers the familiarity the, the belong once again we are not alone I think it all comes back to that. Thank you. Yeah. So there's something in the uh, in the set language of prayer that um, that 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 unites us. And as you're saying, the melody as well, which is uh, you know that's there's there's always this kind of tension between searching out and creating new beautiful tunes that hit us in different ways, and um, and relying on on familiar and and um, uh, perennial, timeless kinds of tunes that that uh, that bring us back. And I think I think it's a uh, the Hasidim would would describe this dynamic as they'd say it's ratzo v'shov. This is something that the the angels are um, are said to. Uh, I think it's the angels that Ezekiel in his visions sees. The angels are said to be, they are running and returning. They're ratso vishov. They go from here to there. Um, and this is kind of a, 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 a Hasidic term to basically to refer to a, a dialectic, uh, to, you know, two things in, in dynamic relationship with one another. But I think that's the case that we are, we are, 
uh, so often, yeah, we are searching for things that, that take us outward and, and bring us to new vistas, but then we're also uh, needing to, to rely on the stuff that brings us home as well. Yeah, Sarah? Oh, you're muted. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think what you said is a, is a really interesting question, but, you know, since you said that that he was a, the first one, Salman Shash, is, is a Hasid, he grew up, you know, in a tradition. And for him, I'm sure that it was, you know, very free. I mean, he knew the form since he was a little baby. So, you know, he could play with things. He was like a, a master, you know, like a jazz pianist. I mean, it was all, he, he could speak from this freedom of knowing a tradition and, for them, I'm sure it was, you know, if you ever, you know, note the Hasidim, you know, celebrating, singing. I mean, it's very joyous. It's very spontaneous. They know these things. I mean, it would be like if all of us grew up, you know, listening to rap music, we could improvise, we could do. So he spoke from a freedom that we might not, you know, really enjoy because of his, his mastery, you know. Um, so we're not really, I mean, I don't really feel like I'm in that position yet. Anyway. Thank you. That's a great point. I think that's absolutely true. That, um, yeah, we, we, when we when we know the foundations, we have the freedom to improvise. You know, musician music is is kind of the perfect analogy with that. That, uh, or uh, you know, art artistry in general, really. That, um, you know, I think the classic example is kind of Picasso. Before he's doing cubism, he's doing photorealism. He's training. You know. Um, and, and all that. And I think you're right that um, having the having that competency uh, really is sort of foundational to our uh, to our deeper experimentation. Because um, we could come at it with no background and just do whatever we want, you know, and that would be good on its in its own way, um, could be good in its own way. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's something to, uh, to play with. And I think I'm reminded that uh, Svara, the project the, uh, the, that is called a radically traditional yeshiva, which is this wonderful uh, learning center that's all about Talmud learning. And, and they, they frame it as, as queer Talmud. Uh, so to some extent, by and for LGBTQ people, but also for all kinds of people who are qu considered queer by society, marginalized in various ways. Um, and uh, at, at their heart, they're all about making uh, this tradition of Talmud learning, which was once just the province of a certain caste of, of uh, learned men, uh, of, of making it accessible to all kinds of people. And they talk about uh, becoming a player. They talk about making people into players so that we're empowered to play with tradition. And I think that's a really great point. We'll, um, let's, we'll read a little bit more. I actually don't know if we'll get to the Amida itself, which I think is okay, but uh, Robin, yeah. Before you go forward, who was it you were just speaking about? Can you say their name again? Oh, Svara is their name. Um, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, the, the, the organization is called Svara or Svara Yeshiva. And uh, one of the main people to look up, uh, her name is Rabbi Bene Lapi. And they're, uh, some of them are good, good friends of Tzichia. We're uh, connected in various ways with them. Um, definitely a great organization to, to check out. Okay, let's read a little more, a little more stuff for us. Maybe we'll read one or two more things. I wanted to share this bit from uh, Rabbi Toba Spitzer, who is a Reconstructionist rabbi and uh, was at one time a rabbi for Tzichia. In the year um, 2000. In the year 2000, which I know was a big year for Tahia. Yes, <laughs> it was. <laughs> she lived through it with us. Wow, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'll just read this. I'll read this one. Um, so she writes, um, to make real use of our liturgy, it's helpful to remember that the words in our prayer book were written as poetry as evocative metaphors to foster certain mind states and attitudes in those who interact with them. Instead of asking, do I believe this? We can ask of a prayer, where is this trust? 
trying to take me. I think that's so profound. She goes on to suggest metaphors like king and creator of the universe are intended to help us feel our own relative smallness in relation to the cosmos, to invoke a sense of humility and service, while at the same time suggesting that there is something in the vastness that both cares about us and holds us accountable, like a parent, like a, a king. The metaphor of parent speaks to, to an experience of returning home, of coming back to that which loves and accepts us. As with any metaphors, we need to remember that these are not definitions of God. They are poetic entryways into an experience of something both within us and around us. This is from a piece where she's explaining about various uh, metaphors for God in Jewish tradition and in inviting us to feel empowered to employ what she calls new old metaphors. Uh, so bringing back metaphors that are, have been sort of marginalized by the mainstream and experimenting with new ones. And I love this line, I'll say it again. Instead of asking, do I believe this? We can ask of a prayer, where is this trying to take me? So many of us get hung up on, do I believe in God? Do you believe in God? Can I be a part of the synagogue if I don't believe in God? So many people get hung up on that. And it's just the kind of thing that's like, that's, it's it to me it's like that's the wrong question so many of us get hung up on belief which is a complicated thing anyway belief is is sort of this immaterial thing i mean what what is it to believe in something you know we believe in gravity but i wouldn't say i believe in gravity you know like um there are uh it's it's a complicated sort of immaterial thing to say i do i believe in 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 God or not. But more concretely, we can ask of the prayer, where is this trying to take me? Uh, yeah, Ross. Um, what you just said reminded me of, I don't know whether it's actually one of the lines that can be attributed to um, um, uh, to the, the person who, who uh, created, um, to Mordechai Kaplan, who created um, reconstruct, not created, who developed, uh, founded reconstructionism, uh, but it's the concept of belonging rather than believing. Uh, believing is, I, I know I've read this somewhere in, in one or another uh, article or book about reconstructionism that the focus is on belonging, not believing. Doesn't mean you can't believe, but the focus is on belonging to a community, to, um, to a, to something larger than yourself. Um, uh, and where is this trying to take me um, makes me think of belonging rather than believing. Absolutely. And it's, I think part of it is that it's um, the, the notion of belonging empowers us with a sense of this is what it is this is what we've got. How am I going to work with it? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, do I, will I take it or leave it? Because you're already sort of, you're already uh, choosing to belong. You know, you don't have to, you're, you're already in it. You're already, um, uh, you know, uh, working with the, uh, that material, you know, you've already kind of opted in and now you, you, uh, there's less of that question of, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm working on that. Yeah, Raz, again. Yeah, I was, uh, you're inspiring me to, to, with the with the language. Um, we're we belong to it, and it belongs to us. Mm. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I'll have to work on that a little bit more. But that that that. Uh, uh, configuration occurred to me. That's lovely. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of time left, so I want to direct us to, let's see, instead of asking, do I believe this, we can ask of a prayer, where is this trying to take me? Mm -hmm. 
So I think we should go to some prayer and, and figure out where is it trying to take us, um, because that's really the practice um, that that uh, we want to be practicing. I think that's a really great way in um, that I think that this kind of question, where is this trying to take me, poses all kinds of possibility. Whereas, do I believe this? You got basically three answers there. Yes, no, or I don't know. And is there a cat there? There is a cat, yep. Oh. <laughs> it was hallucinating. No, no, fear not. Do not, do not adjust your TV set. This is a, okay. a real cat. So I had a couple more uh, quotes. This one's just about uh, Rib Zalman is saying, um, you know, it's great. It's all well and good to have an idea of God that is uh, very transcendental and abstract, but that makes it very hard to talk to. And I want spiritual intimacy. I'll send out these uh, these slides after class because um, they're good quotes to read. And there's, um, I think we will skip our our question but you should hold this in your head about what kinds of God language speaks to you, if any. Mm -hmm. And I think we're ready. I think we're, we're ready to jump into the text. There's also this other juicy nugget from, uh, from uh, Rabbi Jacob Staub, another uh, reconstructionist. And I'll just read this part that says, the entire fixed service has become for him a set of mnemonics that jumpstart in him an ever new variety of meditations. And then he goes on to say, isn't the traditional service, even in the reconstruction of Sidor, laden with anthropomorphic supernatural imagery, you know, stuff we don't believe in, it presents a challenge to our intellectual integrity and thus an obstacle to genuine prayer? The answer for many people is yes unless and until we reinterpret the meaning of images so often that we reach a point at which we read them with new meanings without needing to reinterpret them consciously any longer. And so what he's saying, I think it's a little, maybe a little hard to get on first gloss, but um, that we basically each time that we pray, we're engaged in this active work of figuring out, okay, what does this mean to me? What does this mean to me? What does this mean to me? So much so that uh, there, you know, we, we sort of develop a, um, a repertoire of experiences so that when we encounter it, we see a certain turn of phrase in the Sidor and we're reminded of a certain insight we once had months ago about it. And it kind of becomes this automatic thing where uh, the text becomes so much more than, uh, than, than what is on the page. So let's look at what's on the page. And we'll finally, with uh, just about 10 minutes left, we're finally getting to the Amidah, which is good. This is kind of in line with, you know, that teaching about the the holy ones of old would meditate for an hour before they prayed, and then they would spend an hour with their prayer, and then they would come down for an hour. And then probably have to go back to synagogue for the, the afternoon prayer after that. Um, but we'll go through the Amidah, and let's go through it in English. Well, hmm. We'll do a little combination. We'll do a little combination and we'll break it up into little chunks. And I'll invite you to, uh, when sort of you find something that jumps out to you or that resonates with you or that puzzles you or you have an idea or a thought about it, um, you know, you can raise your hand or your Zoom hand or even if you feel like interrupting, you can do that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just sort of try to parse some meaning from this. So uh, traditional Amidah would be said, standing with feet together, 
three steps back, three steps forward, we say, Adonai sifatai tiftach ufiya techa. Open my lips, beloved one, and let my mouth declare your praise. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu ve'elohe avoteinu ve'imoteinu. Elohe Abraham, Elohe Sarah, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe Rivka, Elohe Yaakov, Elohe Rachel, ve Elohe Le'ah. So we begin the Amidah with our, uh, our blessing of our ancestors. So the first thing we do after asking to open our lips, Adonai Sfatai Tivtach, Ufi Yagiti Latecha, we, uh, we connect with our ancestors. Mm -hmm spiritual ancestors this jake yeah this, go for it i've never like all the years i've said those words i never saw what was going on like you open my lips and let me declare your praise it's a partnership beautiful yeah exactly it is a vision <laughs> yeah it, it 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 goes back and forth that's right yeah it's it's Open my lips, Adonai, Ufi, and I will do the rest. Yeah, and it's and it's what I like too is that it's um, it's it is I will. I mean, it's my lips, but it we can read it kind of literally to say, you know, my my mouth will declare your praise. So it's kind of like make me a vessel, you know, open me up and just. Let me sing, you know, let it, let so it flow I can through me. serve you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's very, well, is... it's very dialogical. You're right. Yeah. This is better than Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's amazing. laughs> All right, let's, let's see what else we got here. And so we, we do our ancestors thing. And then the second uh, um, oh no, this is this is still the first bracha. Then we have this whole this litany. This is what a lot of prayer is, and a lot and and uh, and this is part of the opaque language that it's like if you don't figure out how to make this work for you, this is just you know this is going to continue to be opaque. Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor v'hanora el el yohon gomel chasadim tovim ve'kone ha'kol, etc. etc. Great, heroic, awesome God, supreme divinity, imparting deeds of kindness, begetter of all, mindful of the loyalty of Israel's ancestors, bringing with love redemption to their children's children for the sake of the divine name. Regal one, our help, our salvation and protector. Blessed are you, Adonai, the shield of Abraham, and the help of Sarah. So we have great, heroic, Ha'el Ha'gadol, the big, the strong, the awesome God. El Elyon, God of above, the most high. Gomel Chasadim. Go, you may have heard of Gemilut Chasadim, or like acts of kindness. So God is called Gomel Chasadim, the, 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 the one who does acts of kindness. Gomel Chasadim Tovim, of good good uh, acts of, of good kindness, vikone hakol, the begetter of all. Vizocher chazde avot, vizocher, the one who remembers, like zikaron is like the uh, memorial, or uh, um, what do we say? Zichrono livracha, may their memory be a blessing. Zocher chazde avot v'imot, so the one who remembers the kindness to our, our fathers and mothers, and brings redemption, not just to their children, not just to their banim, but their bene, their children's children. Why? Leman shemo be'ahava. For the sake of God's name, like Hashem, Shemo, Be'ahava. Who knows Ahava? 
love. That's love, right. Yeah. So people, uh, you know, a lot of Jews, understandably, if we start talking about God's love or something like that, a lot of Jews are like, that sounds Christian. I don't like God's love. That sounds very <laughs> Christian. And yeah, okay, it is. But, uh, it, you know, Christianity emphasizes God's love. But Judaism emphasizes God's love as well. And here's an example of it. It's beautiful. It's for the sake of God's name with love. So it's not, you know, we don't say that God is uh, so great because God remembers what God did for our ancestors, um, you know, to demonstrate God's power. No, it's, it's for the sake of love. That's why that's, you know, this is an area where like, if you're, if you're someone who's, uh, you know, theistic or God curious or interested in exploring a relationship with God or something, here's a real opening for it to be like, wow, this is all of a sudden th this whole prayer takes on a different vector because it's about the heart. It's not just about the ancestors. It's about uh, relationship. And uh, like how Rhoda said, it's a, it's a dialogic kind of back and forth, but it's not just about me and God, it's about me and God and God and my ancestors too. And those children's children. It's like, how can we read that line about uh, children's children without thinking about our own children's children? You know, so it's, it's kind of, it's going, we can expand it to think of it in both directions, not just uh, the past and the present, but also the future. And then the uh, the chatima, the the signature that ties it together, melech ozer umoshia umagen. Again, another kind of litany of invocations of of divine titles, divine attributes each of which could be a, a sort of name of God in a way. Melech, king. Ozer, helper. Mm -hmm. Moshia, savior, salvation. Uh, protector, magen means shield. Mm -hmm. And then, blessed are you, Adonai, the shield of Abraham and the help of Sarah. So there's a lot here. We'll continue on for a little bit and... Uh, see what else we can glean. So that's just all the first bracha, the first blessing. Mm -hmm. Then, so we talked about ancestors, we talked about love. Now we're talking about power. I'll even, uh, maybe we'll just look at the English to see the translation. Givu wrote, divine power. You are forever powerful, almighty one, abundant in your saving acts. Mm -hmm. You send down, or you cause the wind to blow and the rain to fall. In loyalty, you sustain the living, nurturing the life of every living thing. This is a, uh, this is where we hear, Michalkel chayim bechesed, mechaye kol chay berachamim rabim. So this is another uh, uh, area where um, we would have a, uh, the um, in non-reconstructionist liturgy, we have mechalchel kachayim bechesed mechaye metim berachamim rabim. So who who brings life to the dead? But this is again, this is all about listing these divine attributes. Chayim bechesed mechaye kol chay, the bringer of uh, the enlivener of life, berachamim rabim. In, in rachamim, in compassion, in great compassion. Rabim, like uh, toda rabba, is like a great thank you. Many thanks. This is uh, many compassion, great compassion. Yeah, Victoria. I think this might be another example of what Rhoda was saying. Um, uh, in summer, the prayer says you send down the dew. In winter, you cause the wind to blow and rain to fall. Um, and, and what's our part of it? Of, of protecting the water. 
protecting the land. Um, you know, so again, there's this back and forth to it. You know, you send the water and we have to protect that. That's where it takes me anyway. You know, I, if you hadn't said that, Victoria, I couldn't say this, that we are given life so that we can live. I mean, this is, well, I'm so glad I tuned in tonight. <laughs> and I just want to say one thing, you know, and this is a sad thing, but we've been talking about protection and our children. And, you know, I'm just really devastated about what happened to those four children. You know, and I mean, this is exactly our duty to protect them. We don't, you know, this kind of thing with these guns, uh, so unnecessary and so contrary to the so-called right to life movement that, you know, has taken hold of this country. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, I think oh. that's, that's exactly right. And this is also, you know, we spoke about uh, prayer as, as, as uh, we have these fixed words and then we, they give us something to grapple with and something to, to uh, engage with. And we don't know what will come up until we start engaging with it. And I think that's, I, I'm right there with you, Sarah. It's uh, tremendously sad for, I, I know, uh, I don't know if all of us on the call are are local or not, but there was an awful uh, uh, school shooting yesterday in Oxford, Michigan, uh, where four students were killed um, and others wounded. And I think you're right that like when we, you know, when we engage with prayer, harboring the, uh, whether it's a belief, an intuition, a, um, an imagination, a, an aspiration, a wish that there is something kind of ordering it all and, uh, you know, causing, causing good things to happen, upholding those who fall, uh, healing the sick, remaining faithful to all life, it's, but also uh, taking up that, taking up that duty to protect ourselves. I mean, protect our children, you know, that, that uh, God can't do that for us. You know, we've got to do that by, you know, getting rid of guns. I mean, we've got to do that. I think that's what Victoria was saying. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're right that there's, uh, it's, it's an invitation, I think that, what was it that, uh, that Toba Spitz, Rabbi Toba Spitzer said, uh, where is this trying to take me? And we can think of, uh, you know, uh, that, that perhaps this prayer is, you know, inviting us to a place of uh, empowerment. And there's a, there's, like I said, it's as, as so often, uh, these things are so dialectical that we're speaking about divine power. You know, in one sense, it's the opposite of human agency. And in the other, how can we speak about divine power without speaking about our human power and our responsibility to, uh, to align ourselves with divine power and, and, uh, um, and to, uh, you know, uh, especially in our reconstructionist liturgy where we are focusing uh, with these lines to say, kol chai, each life. Uh, rather than talking about the mate team, the, those who have died and, and their resurrection, when we're talking about enlivening life, um, I think it really does uh, invite us to that position of, um, of, of responsibility and um, empowerment. And so there's kind of this interesting and almost paradoxical thing that happens where we, um, in recognizing in, in, in pouring out our recognition of the power that's greater than us, we're also uh, coming to a different position of relationship with our own power. Yeah. So I think we might stop here for tonight at, um, even though we've just scratched the surface of the Amidah, but what I will encourage y'all to do is to, um, to sit with the Sidor Explore the Amidah. I'll send out these uh, these slides, which contain the uh, the Shabbat Amidah. So it's 
um, you know, this is our abbreviated uh, four, five, six, seven blessing Amida, rather than our, our 19 blessing one. Um, but I'll send these out and I'll encourage you to, uh, whether alone or with a partner or a group, um, to work through the Amida in this way to see where are those standout moments, to see what it engenders in you, and to see what comes up. And, um, you know, drawing on that uh, little bit that I shared from Rabbi Jacob Staub, these insights, these reinterpretations that you do, uh, you know, they, you'll kind of file them, either you write them down in the C-door or not, or you write them on a piece of paper or something, or you just think them, but they'll get filed away in your mind somewhere and chances are they'll come back to you and you'll face the prayer again another time and it'll open up a different avenue of meaning. And so I, I do really think that, um, like I said, even though we want to uh, build our competency with the Hebrew, with the traditional words, um, that the Hebrew words will have a stronger foundation if you have, if you develop that kind of uh, sensitivity and foundation and grounding in the meaning of the prayer. So with all this in mind, I'll invite you to, you know, do that for homework and we'll meet again for mm -hmm. uh, next week on uh, Wednesday, same time, seven o'clock Eastern time. And uh, we'll cover some odds and ends and we'll see what else we want to talk about. And I, uh, Indeed, if you have ideas for things that you want to address for next week, uh, please do let me know. And uh, I'll stick around for just a little bit tonight for uh, some further question and answer. So uh, happy Hanukkah and uh, take oh, care. Yeah. Thank you, Jake.